Just Thrive is a company that I've been aware of for a long time. First came across them through Dave Asprey's podcast years ago, and it is a product line that I have brought in to our store and used for years. With that, Joni is uh, over their education department, the resource between, uh, you know, wholesalers, retailers, and just the education side of it. She does a great job of helping me understand a lot of things over the years, and I hope that you enjoy this conversation as we dive into K2. Joni, uh, excited to be visiting with you, especially in a way where we can share with others. You have taught me so much over the years uh, and definitely been an asset for uh, you know our health journey. So uh, how did you get to the point that you were working with Just Thrive? And uh, if you don't care, go into a little bit of that uh, health journey that you, you had. Oh, sure. Well, I basically got involved in the natural foods and supplements industry when I was 19, when I started working at a store and reading the books. And I was I was a dead duck from that point on. I was like, this is my path. Um, and uh, as part of that, for example, I was uh, for 11 years a Weston Price chapter leader. I don't know if your uh, your viewer listeners are familiar, but they are a nonprofit uh, education based organization that looks uh, very closely at the work that Dr. Weston Price did, and he's very interesting because he his research naturally ties into Just Thrive, uh, which I didn't discover until after I'd been a chapter leader for a number of years which is that the research microbiologist behind Just Thrive, Kieran Krishnan, he initially was very interested in the research being done around vitamin K2. Um, and K2 is a nutrient that is much better known uh, in Europe because they were doing more research over there first, uh, which is how Kieran knows, because Kieran has his fingers in a lot of international fronts. And he knew that K2 is a, a very uh, little understood. And in fact, the research is so uh, exploding on it. Uh, they are finding, they're now, researchers are now calling K2 a uh, ubiquitous vitamin because they are finding that no matter what condition you study, uh, at some point you will find a K2 deficiency linked to that condition. And he's a research microbiologist and in the nutritional supplements field, the only way at this point that you can commercially produce K2 is using bacteria, specifically the spore-based bacteria Bacillus subtilis. Because abroad in Japan, there are uh, regions that have been eating uh, natto, which is a traditional Japanese food. It is fermented. They take bean paste and they put Bacillus subtilis on it. The Bacillus subtilis eats the carbohydrates and naturally produces very high levels of a natural form of vitamin K2. So natto is acknowledged as being the world's richest source of vitamin K2. And there are people in Japan that for five centuries have been eating very high levels of K2. In fact, samurai swore by it. Um, and so Kieran, the research microbiologist behind Just Thrive, was studying vitamin K2 and wanted to be involved with producing a really high quality natural K2. Um, so the way I got introduced, so back to Weston Price, Dr. Weston Price, in his research way back in the 20s, studying indigenous peoples all around the world. And he only looked at indigenous peoples that were known for being extremely healthy. He was looking for people that had extraordinary health, 
that had straight spines, that had perfect teeth as a dentist, that was important to him. And he knew that the condition of the spine and the teeth was actually um, a, uh, a forerunner of overall health. You know, that one of the first places that poor nutrition showed up was in those areas, and then it would uh, advance to other areas. So uh, back in the 20s, he found tribes of people extremely healthy. He found out that what they valued was um, what he called activator X, because he didn't know what the nutrient was back then. But he found that across the board around the world, these really healthy people valued uh, foods that were uh, high in vitamin K2, which he called Activator X. So um, it was eventually figured out uh, that what, pre what Western Price was uh, promoting was the importance of a diet with high levels of K2. And then kind of simultaneously, um, I ran across uh, uh, the co-owner of Just Thrive, Tina Anderson, through a friend of mine who met her at a nutrition conference. And she said, I spent a long time talking to this person. You have to talk to her. Um, and my friend was also a, a Western Price chapter leader, so I knew she knew her nutrition. And as soon as I began speaking with Tina over the phone, I knew immediately that what she was telling me about these spore bacillus bacteria and what they naturally do in the gut and what their natural byproducts are, which include vitamin K2, um, that this was going to be a huge next level up in the industry because back then, which was 2016, uh, if you said probiotic back then, it automatically meant lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And what was different about what Tina was talking to me about was a probiotic that was spore bacillus based. It was proven to 100% survive alive and colonize in the gut. And uh, the research that she was talking to me about was just blowing my hair back because I've been in this industry my whole life and I had never heard about this research. And I knew it was going to be uh, a big level up in our industry. So it started with the spore-based probiotic, but uh, at the same time, the second product, which they had already introduced, was their vitamin K2 product. So we started out with those two, and then we have expanded from there. So Joni, let's let's go into a little bit of the the vitamin K. What what is vitamin K? What's the difference from say K one and K two, or even the uh, you know MK seven versus uh, you know mini Q four? What the difference is in there? Let's just break down like why does K matter at all? And if you can just uh, clarify a little bit of the blood thinner, because I have sure. lots of people always tell me that I can't take K because I'm on a blood thinner. Right. So if, if you don't care, just let's take a deep dive into the K. Okay. So the important thing to understand about vitamin K2 is there's a lot of misunderstanding, even amongst doctors out there, because what they were ta taught uh, when they were in med school was based on older science. And the bottom line is, is that the old science discovered vitamin, what they called vitamin K. You know, we had A, B, C, et cetera. Well, they discovered K and they knew that vitamin K, vitamin K was intimately involved with uh, bones and teeth, but also they began to figure out that somehow or another it had to do with thinning the blood. Eventually, as the research evolved, they began to identify discrete components that are part of K2. So hence K1, K2, K3, etc. What's important to understand is, is that when you're talking about the blood thinning aspect, that is specific to K1, has nothing to do with K2. So when people say, I can't go on vitamin K because I'm on a blood thinner, there's two things to understand about that. First of all, they frequently mix up K2 in there when it should not be. 
Second thing is, is that there is a new classification of blood thinners. The old style blood thinners are warfarin, coumadin, etc. And yes, you cannot be on vitamin K1 at the same time as being on coumadin or warfarin. However, within the last mm, five years or so, they've come up with a whole new class of blood thinners. And forgive me, but the only one that I can remember the name of is Eliquis, but there's a whole batch of them. And the old style blood thinners were really, a, excuse my French, pain in the butt to be on because you had all these dietary restrictions. It was very difficult. Not true for the new class. What I just read online recently is something like 91% of folks are now on the new class of blood thinners. If you're on the new class, my understanding is you do not need to worry about vitamin K1 or K2, any kind of K. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff anymore. Of course, you always have to have that conversation with your doctor, but I will tell you that I went on blood thinners uh, briefly last uh, spring, a year ago, and that was what my doctor told me. So, did that answer all your questions? Yeah, no, let's uh, go into a little bit more of like, what's some common vitamin K deficiency symptoms? What are what are some things that we can say, mm, wow, that, that may be something that we need to consider? Okay, so the first thing you want to do is make sure you're not talking about K. Because K now has, we now know, these discrete subcategories. And these discrete subcategories do very different things in the body. So, for example, the product that we have is specifically K2, and it's a very specific form of K2, because when you're making K2 at the commercial level, uh, you have the uh, option to make an artificial form. Just Thrive opts not to make an artificial K2, uh, the reason being primarily that the research shows that uh, an artificial K2 it has a very short half-life. Um, and my understanding about the way you measure a half-life when you're looking at nutritional supplements is you want to look at the blood serum level. And you want to see how active or present that nutrient is at the blood serum level. Because when it's circulating in your blood, that's when your body really has the opportunity to pick it up and use it. Um, so looking at uh, artificial K2, the science is that uh, it's only active in your blood for about two hours, which means in theory, if you want to have it available to you, you got to take it every two hours. Nobody can remember to do that. It's ridiculous, right? So, um, unfortunately, um, it used to be like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago that when you looked at a vitamin label, it was very easy to distinguish an artificial K2 versus a natural K2. The natural K2, uh, you would see vitamin K2 and then in parentheses, menaquinone-7. And sometimes some companies would shorten it to MK7. If you saw that on a label, you were golden. That meant it was the natural form. You were good. And the natural form is wonderful because the natural form remains active at the blood serum level for like 24 hours or more. Um, then, you know, because artificial forms are generally speaking cheaper for your manufacturer, um, somebody somewhere developed a menaquinone 7 artificial form of K2. And the further complication is that the FDA does not require when a company is using the artificial form of a nutrient, they don't require that that be stated on the label. So what companies do is when they use the uh higher quality, more natural form, this applies to K2 or whatever the nutrient is, they will generally somewhere on the label to distinguish themselves, say natural, in the case of K2, 
you can see from fermentation because if a K2 is from fermentation, it's going to be guaranteed natural, etc. So it's unfortunate because it means that when the cheaper form of a nutrient is used, your customer, generally speaking, does not know how to distinguish. All they know is, is that the price tab is cheaper, so they grab the cheaper product off shelf. So for, at this point, for educational purposes for your consumers, um, if they want a natural form of K2, you look on the label and first thing you want to look for is, is it menoquinone 4 or menoquinone 7? Uh, because if it's menoquinone 7, hopefully that will be a natural form. And the way you can confirm that is look elsewhere on the label for that natural from fermentation, you know, so it's you want two things on your label. You want to see menoquinone 7, and you want to see something from the manufacturer saying that it's the natural form. Because at this point, about 75, 80% of your menoquinone 7s are now artificial. So, um, you know, bottom line is you absolutely want the natural form. The, the artificial form is very um, inefficient uh, in terms of uh, the amount that you, the customer's going to get because they just can't take it frequently enough to make it really effective. Yeah, well, yeah, I, and I didn't realize the half-life was that uh, substantially different. Um, Joni, the more we look at these artificial forms, the more that we can see some problems downstream and down, down the road. So, you know, say folic acid uh, versus a methylated form of uh, that. That's a huge difference, right? And so, a lot so of the I, stuff coming out around. Insert a PS there. The natural form of B complex is always made by uh, uh, bacteria in your gut. So the, the most effective way to make sure you have adequate B complex is not by consuming it because Anything that you consume has to go through uh, that extreme acidity of stomach acid. So the best thing you can do to support your B-complex levels, including B12 for vegans, is to make sure you have a healthy gut microbiome and your gut bacteria are making them for you right there, right next to the microvilli. That's, I think that's such an important uh, point, the uh, endogenous production from the microbiome versus trying to take a supplement. And, and I'm, I'm, I, I am wholeheartedly with you. You know, Lander, my son's cancer is what got me into this whole world. And um, you can see that supplements can be absolutely life-saving or they can be detrimental. Uh, and, and it's it's one extreme or the other. It really is. And I think a lot of supplements have actually hurt people to the degree that they don't even realize it while there are others. And that's why you got to do your due diligence. And I think that this is why I value Just Thrive. And, and a few of the other companies that I work with, because it's the education, it's the constantly learning, and we're not having this uh, flag stuck in the ground that this is how it is forever. It's it's always it's always learning. It's always and every time that I come across something else, and I circle back to make sure that it's uh, in line with what y'all are doing. Y'all are ahead of the game. Y'all 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 have beat me to the punch. You know, because I had some concerns if you remember on early on with the uh, jute, the Just Calm product that y'all came out with, because in uh, in understanding the MTHFR, uh, more so, I, I, got, I got a little scared on, on the B vitamins. So before before we go more into the probiotic, because I, I want to do that, I want to paint that picture a little bit more on why K2 is so important. Can you lay out how the vitamin D correlation is with K and, and just kind of give us some, some examples of, uh, you know, how scurvy or rickets or, or something that people can relate K to deficiency with. So the way I think of K2, and remember that's different from K2, which is your blood thinner. K2 is all about your bones and teeth as well as at a deeper level, it goes all the way down to your mitochondria because uh, K2 is, I think of it as your body's calcium traffic officer. It is intimately connected to how your body uses 
calcium. So when your body is efficiently using calcium, you're going to have strong skeletal structure, good teeth. And, you know, we know that how important calcium is at the blood serum level. All of that is going to be in balance and working perfectly. When we don't have, so as the traffic officer, think of the, the K2 calcium traffic officer on the beat directing traffic. Calcium is probably one of our most abundant minerals. Every time we open our mouth and eat food, we're consuming calcium. Even for somebody who's like a raw food vegan, maybe, maybe they're deficient in calcium. But the reality is calcium is normally, naturally, extremely abundant to us. We shouldn't have to be taking much in terms of a supplement. Um, and mostly what happens for most people if they're deficient is they don't have that traffic officer making sure that they are utilizing the calcium that's coming into them through their food. So we do know that uh, most all of us are deficient in vitamin K2. For example, there was a mega study done. It was published not that long ago. I think it was 2015, 2016. It was done by a nutritional sciences college. And it was a mega study because what they did was they looked at the vitamin K2 levels in people's blood serum for, I think it was 492, so almost 500 people. And what they found was, and they tested children and adults, that 97% were K2 deficient. So we're all deficient to some degree or another. It's really just a matter. And since we know we're all getting lots of calcium, uh, the, the calcium deficiencies are the result actually of lacking the K2. So when you don't have that traffic officer on the beat, calcium's coming into the system through the food, the body gets all confused and says, okay, we don't have the traffic officer to tell us what to do with all this calcium. So we're going to put it over here in storage. Where does your body like to put things in storage? Soft tissue. So you are, from the moment you are deficient, you are starting to put these crystals into soft tissue all over your body. So it could be hypothesized that one of the first um, ways to notice a K2 deficiency is any kind of stiffening, right? Stiffening anywhere. And so the body be puts the crystals and your tissues begin to get stiff. And then as that begins to fill up, it actually winds up looking like um, plaque in veins and arteries. That's the second way that you can uh, notice a K2 deficiency. That, of course, is going to be much more invisible. That uh, depositing of plaque and veins and arteries is considered to be the link between having a K2 deficiency and cardiac events. Also, similarly to any kind of issue having to do with forgetfulness, because when we have a narrowing of the veins and arteries going in and out of the brain and or the brain itself getting stiffer, you're talking about a reduction in oxygen. Right. So this gives you an idea of the kinds of clinical studies that are being uh, looked at with K2 deficiencies. Uh, they're also finding that these sorts of issues uh, show up in, in surprising ways of dysfunction. For example, there's a fairly recent study out of Tufts linking the K2 deficiency to uh, difficulties with maintaining effective blood sugar levels. Who knew, right? Uh, it's also linked to neuropathy and uh, decreases in circulation to your extremities, of course, right? So uh, the list is getting very extensive and the kinds of uh, studies that they're doing, uh, what they're studying is just exploding, exploding. And they have actually brought it down to the mitochondrial level at this point. So uh, the story that I heard from Karen that I thought was fascinating, and I, I'll tell you right now, I can't find confirmation for it, 
So I don't know where he heard it, but he said that there was a um, researcher who was given samples of tissue and the researcher's job was simply to analyze the differences between the two samples, not being told what, what the issue was that was already identified elsewhere. The only difference that this researcher could find was literally way down at the mitochondrial level. And it turns out that the one sample that had a 5% uh, mitochondrial activity level was from a 90-year-old person. The other one, which had a something like 95% mitochondrial activity level was from a five-year-old child. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. It's, uh, more and more and more is coming out on, on mitochondria and how important it is and that it does, you know, obviously a lot more than just simply uh, be the powerhouse of the cell. And so that I think that that's super fascinating that uh, we really don't know much about the mitochondria, I think, in the grand scheme of things, but, but it's vitally important. Let's go into the the vitamin D because I feel like oh, I about that. everybody I talk to is deficient in vitamin D. And what their doctors typically do is they have them take a, a 50,000 IU of vitamin D3 once a, a week, right? Like that that's kind of the standard thing I think everybody that is told that they have low vitamin D to do. Now, with that, they don't take K2. They don't have, there's, there's no A involved. Uh, sulfur's never discussed. Magnesium's never discussed. It's simply a take this very large amount of D3. Mm -hmm. So will you go into the kind of, well, honestly, the problem with that, and then another reason why we have got to be getting our K2. Okay. So an important thing to remember about K2 is we always associate it with, um, you know, vitamins A, vitamin D, all that kind of thing. Those vitamins are technically and accurately oil soluble, meaning to say, if you take too much of those in a supplement form, you can actually induce poisoning because they are retained in your fat tissues. K2 is not like that. And this is a source of huge confusion, especially uh, amongst uh, doctors, I'm finding. So K2 is actually a protein fraction. And no toxicity has ever been found associated with K2 consumption. And this is an important thing when you have to especially consider dosing children because in that same uh, mega study that I told you where 97% were found to be uh, K2 deficient, children were found to need seven to 10 times more K2 than adults, which totally makes sense because children are building their skeletal structure and their teeth. And to me, when I read that, like the light bulb went off on, of course, this is why children get cavities when they're a kid, and then all that disappears as they get older, because their K2 levels reduce once they've built their body. So um, the other thing that's important to understand is that in order to effectively be activated as that calcium traffic officer, you know, your K2 is your calcium traffic officer. The officer has to take vitamin D and combine it together with your K2 before it can be used in the process of effectively utilizing your calcium. And utilizing calcium has a front and a back to it, as it were. So if you have calcium... Uh, crystals stored in your soft tissue, the first thing your body is going to do when you get adequate K2 levels is to begin to remove that hardening, the crystallization from your soft tissues so it can put it where it does belong, in your teeth, in your bones, etc. So you have to have both of them available to you at the same time in order to be able to do that. The tricky part when you're supplementing is uh, getting the correct ratio and make sure 
making sure that you don't get too much vitamin D because um, it doesn't matter how much K2 you take, you can never get too much because however much K2 you dump into the body, it appears now that what happens is the body takes up enough of those protein fractions that it needs in the moment to combine with D and whatever else it needs the K2 for. And then whatever extra is left over will simply be disposed of by the body non-toxically. D is a different matter because if you take more than what you need, your body is going to go and put that in your uh, uh fat tissues, and it will continue to pull on that over time. So this is why it's a huge advantage that K2 uh, is active at your blood serum level for 24 hours or more because your D is going to be available to you through your fat tissue for gradually being able to access it. And your K2 is active at the blood serum level and your body's putting them together and using them. The problem with taking these huge amounts of vitamin D is, is that uh, you can actually make a K2 deficiency worse. So we now know that 97% of us, or about, are already deficient in K2. Then we go about dumping in way, way more vitamin D. And now your body's going, well, I need more K2. I need more K2. I need, right? And so when it cannot combine them because you don't have the K2 available, it's just going to start sticking all of that vitamin D in your fat tissues. So um, I've actually uh, been put in touch through Facebook uh, with three different people who um, it would appear that they have developed, uh, God, now what is the, the condition called? H hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia is when you get a diagnosis for having too much uh, calcium uh, that is specifically linked to getting too much vitamin D. And in my opinion, it's not so much that they have too much hyper, they have hypercalcemia, but they have that really because it's a hidden vitamin K2 deficiency. Right? Mm -hmm. But, but what, wow. what happens is, uh, people are only focused on the D. They need to broaden yep. that to make sure they're always taking the correct ratio. So when our very first vitamin K2 product actually did not have any D in it because we were so concerned about that, we are yep. aware that most people are already getting vitamin D through a multi or whatever. And so we didn't want to add vitamin D to our product and make that worse. And unfortunately, you know, people are educated enough to know that you should get both, but they're not educated to the degree that they really understand the correct ratio. So that product didn't sell as well as we would like, right? So we did introduce a second product. The second product is only our natural form of K2 and vitamin D in the correct ratio. The first formula has other cofactors in it that the body needs and does not have the K2. Frankly, I like to take them both because that way I know I'm getting enough D and I know I don't have to worry about getting too much K2. So, yeah, no, I think, I think the, you know, and I didn't understand this, Joni. It took me a very long time to get to the point to where I am. I understood because the K supplement is, is very con expensive in comparison to what a lot of these supplements are. And it was, it was very hard for me to grasp that and to be able to articulate the importance of it. But you know, the toxicity levels, everything that you're saying is, is making so much sense. And the parallels to what uh, Morley Robbins and I have talked about numerous times on iron and copper is just really interesting to me. Just you talk about the traffic, uh, cop or the traffic director. I mean, coppers, I mean, the same way with iron. And so it, it's very interesting to me that how the body has, has, uh, this mitigating or navigational component and things don't work independently. Never. I don't, I haven't yeah. found anything yeah. that works yeah. independently. Yeah. 
So go, let's go into some of those cofactors real quick on the, on the K2 supplement, such as, you know, you'll have magnesium in there. You have zinc in there. Why, why are minerals so important? Well, you know, the body never does anything in isolation. It, 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 the processes are just so complex that, uh, just as you said, there's always some need for some additional nutrients. And, you know, research is such a complicated issue because um, <laughs> it's really up to the formulator to decide, well, what are the most common deficiencies? What do I think my product is? needs to have in order to treat the broadest number of people most effectively. You know, and, and it's a, it's, it's going to, there will never be a nutritional supplement formula that will be perfect because everybody is completely unique, right? So for our product, we added for the uh, vitamin K2, uh, seven, we added in vitamin K1, which remember K1 and K2 do different things in the body. We also added in the zinc and, um, God, what's, what's the other magnesium. magnesium? Thank you. And the magnesium and the zinc are both in their most bioavailable forms. So the methylated forms, very easy for the body to take those forms up. Um, and then the reason is, is simply because when the traffic officer is putting things together, so we can effectively use that calcium that we're getting from our food, it needs all three of those. It's always best to take them at the same time in that then all four of those nutrients will be available to your body simultaneously. That's your guarantee. You've got enough at the moment of consumption. But it could be, you know, in theory, that you could take those cofactors out and then your body would have to get it from other areas, which for most people could possibly be fine. But, you know, if you want to make the best uh, formula available, put them in so that you know that that person's going to have enough to be able to effectively utilize their calcium. Did that yeah. make sense? Did yeah. that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does. I, th I think that the... Uh to me, the the K two product that y'all have is, is a no brainer. I think it's the perfect insurance to uh, mitigate a lot of the things that uh, we're we're facing. But ideally, in say let's say ancestrally and, and historically, we would have been able to get a lot of these B vitamins, uh, the K, based off having a healthy gut microbiome, right, and and not having the uh, glyphosate, right? So having having glyphosate uh, chelates our minerals, so we don't have access to a lot of the minerals in the diet. Well, can I it give you another an point about about that? Okay, it absolutely. Is, that's actually, from my perspective, a fairly small part of what's so damaging to me as a person who is trained in the gut microbiome. The most damaging aspect of glyphosate is it is a a, a patented antibiotic, but it is unique. Yep. Most antibiotics that we consume as medication go down to the gut and they kill good guys and bad guys both. It kind of levels the playing field, right? And when we consume any kind of antibiotic from your gut microbiome's perspective, you're, it's like dumping poison into their house. So they go, ah, poison, poison. <laughs> and they run away from the glyphosate and they bury themselves in the what I call the mucosal blanket. So our body to protect our fragile gut wall, which is only one cell thick, it lays a very uh, hopefully thick and resilient layer of mucus over the gut wall. So your bacteria embed themselves in that mucosal barrier as deeply as they can in order to escape the killing effects of the antibiotic. So when you, so that's why they've never invented an antibiotic yet that can 100% kill all the bacteria, right? The moment you stop taking the antibiotic is when the bacteria begin to reemerge in order to repopulate your gut. The problem is that you are at high risk at that moment that what emerges from hiding to repopulate are going to be those drug resistant, really dangerous, harmful ones and not your beneficials. Because if it's the bad guys that emerge first, 
There are no beneficials to keep them in check. And now they take over the population of your gut and you wind up ultimately, it doesn't happen right away. So it's hard to, to link it. But eventually you wind up actually being sicker than before you took the antibiotic. Now, glyphosate is a whole other category of antibiotic in that it actually targets your beneficial bacteria and leaves the bad guys alone. Okay. And you got to remember that almost all commercially erased food has some degree of glyphosate on it. And so it's this constant process of constantly dumping this antibiotic that is going to leave your bad guys alone and, and kill your good guys. So it encourages the overgrowth of the baddies. So yes, it will bind up with minerals. We do know that. But it is a, a very, uh, the most challenging form of antibiotic that we could possibly mm. be consuming. I'll take regular, you know, a clindamycin over glyphosate any day. I think that that just kind of shows the importance of uh, having a good regiment with uh, optimizing the, the microbiome. And I think that, you know, just thriving the spore-based probiotics that y'all put together, I think are the, the constant gardener, uh, so to speak, yes. of yes. of cultivating yes. the, the microbiome in, in a way that does the exact opposite of what you just said. Um, and and so we actually did, we do know that the spore bacillus are resistant to the effects of glyphosate. So they remain alive in the presence of glyphosate. That's, that's awesome. Well, I have seen it absolutely change lives. I think this is, I think this is the fifth year that I'm, I've been working with y'all and, uh, I've just seen it change lives and it's a, a regular thing. It's probably the most re, uh, re bought supplement that, that I have at, at the market. And it's because it works. Uh, it just helps people. And, uh, so many times, Joni, uh, because I mean, it's not a, it's not a, an inexpensive uh, product. So many times people have gone away from it to try something out and they come back uh, like every, every time. And I think that that is a testament to what's actually going on. And, uh, we got a lot of sick people, but, uh, we, we've got a lot of amazing, amazing people that are coming together to offer solutions. I think that's the, well, you know, there, that's there's the one in ingredient in the spore probiotic that I think it's totally unique to just thrive. It's totally unique to the spore based probiotic and antioxidant. Nobody else has this ingredient. And that is the Bacillus Indicus HU36 strain. That is actually patented for use because that bacteria has been proven to go down to the gut, attached right on your damaged gut wall, right next to the microvilli. And what it does is it cranks out really high levels of antioxidants. And the reason that is so important is because, you know, all tissue damage, when we get tissue that is uh, inflamed, damaged, that is called oxidative damage to our tissue. That oxidative damage happens potentially anywhere in the body, including the brain. What does tissue that has oxidative damage need? High, high levels of antioxidants. Antioxidants are everything. And in particular, when you're looking at trying to seal up a leaky gut, which is so important because, you know, we know that 97 to 99% of Americans have such a damaged gut wall that there's holes in it. When we get holes in our gut lining, we are leaking toxins into the bloodstream. And those toxins have the opportunity then to be carried around and inflaming and damaging tissue literally anywhere in the body. So key is to seal up those holes in the gut first and foremost to reduce the toxicity level. That is what that one single strain that's unique to our product does so effectively because it's producing those antioxidants right there on the damaged gut wall. And the researchers behind our leaky gut study, which showed that incredible 42% sealing up of the gut wall at just one cap a day and one bottle, 
they hypothesize that that one single strain is actually the primary driver behind that incredible statistic. Nobody else in our industry has anything even remotely close, especially when you're talking specifically about leaky gut. So, you know, I think that's part of the reason you see such a difference for so many people and why when they try to switch over, it just doesn't work. Love it. Well, Joni, thank you. Thank you so much for, I mean, honestly, years of uh, education. And uh, I think the whole team has been incredible. Uh, Tina, Tina's been on a couple times. She's been wonderful. I uh, haven't had Kieran on yet, but I've watched so many of his, his talks. Uh, I think he's absolutely brilliant. And so just thank you all for what you do and uh, appreciate the friendship and the, uh, you know, the partnership. Likewise, so much Logan. I did not realize that it had been five years. I can't believe that. That's so awesome. Really yeah. wonderful, wonderful. It's, it's, thanks, thanks for it's all well. you do for us, getting the word out there. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you, Joni, and uh, we will visit soon. Okay, thanks again, Logan. Thank you for joining us on Sewing Prosperity. Be sure to follow along across the social media platforms, including YouTube, and be sure to go to sewingprosperity.com.